from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're in the Library of Congress. Um, it's May 9th, 2012. I'm with our, the honoree for the Gershwin Prize for American Song. My name is Mark Horowitz. Bert Backrack is here. Um, and our focus today is going to be on you as a composer, the process of composing. And my first question, um, given the Gershwin Prize, we know that some songwriters like Gershwin and Harold Arlen sort of kept little notebooks with them to jot down tunes as they came to them. Is, is that part of your process at all? Do you get ideas like that? And I, It's definitely my process. And it's, um, if not... Um, on an airplane, if it's not like uh, music paper, and it rarely is, then it's um, a cocktail napkin, uh, uh, half of a page of legal pad, you know, mm -hmm. that I'll borrow from somebody, and I'll just draw a staff and, um, and put four lines. They are off four Five lines, lines, right? Five lines. Five lines. <laughs> See, that's a very important thing for me to, to impart to um, uh, aspiring musicians, songwriters, composers, that um, the, the, the ability to learn how to notate mm -hmm. music, very important, very key. Um, are, are the ideas always melodic ideas? Do you, do you sometimes write harmonic notes yeah, about no, them? I'll, I'll hear the harmonic. It, are they, but are they always for the melody, or do you sometimes get an idea for an accompaniment or a vamp? Um, many of the songs um, that I've written, many of the things that I've written, you could say like a song like Walk On By. So mm -hmm. what happened with Walk On By is that became formed it's almost like the orchestration came with it, where the flugelhorns would come in, uh, where the strings would come in, what the drum pattern might be. Uh, that keyboard figure and walk on by, that was, and as I heard that, played it, and said, well, I'm going to write the orchestration, and I'm going to write it for two pianos and we'll get two grand pianos in the studio with the orchestra, and we'll have the two keyboard players. I, was going to, I don't think I played on that date, just conducted or was in the booth. Um, and I'll have them both play the identical hmm. uh, part. Just for the thickness of the texture or just the for, volume? Yeah, just for, because it will not be an exact, like, overdub. It'll be like, There'll be two different textures. The keyboard the texture uh, will differ from the other keyboard texture. And I think that uh, it's a good idea, you know. I mean, <laughs> well, so, you're, so many of your chords are so rich and, and thick and surprising. Yeah. And th there's two kinds of harmony, the vertical harmony and the horizontal ha harmony, in, in terms of how much of it is you think this is where I am in the song, this is the melody note, this is how I want to harmonize it, versus do you have a harmonic outline for a whole song? Does, is that part of well, I have to, to Well, I have to try, Mark, to look at a, the vertical uh, outlook. That's why it's important for me to get away from the keyboard, uh, both in orchestrating and both in composing, because I have to try to hear the whole thing as an entity rather than um, uh, be kind of like enchanted by a bar that sounds really good. And, but where is that going to be in the overall three, four bars? Where, where does it lead to? Where's the relief? Where is, the, where is where you can stand back? And that's why uh, a normal process will be for me to be able to um, get away from the keyboard and 
uh, and then come back and check it out at the keyboard and go from the couch to the keyboard. And, and sometimes on recording dates, uh, what I would do uh, with musicians sitting in the studio, and if I was stuck, something wasn't working, I'd give a 10-minute break to the orchestra, and um, I'd go into the, um, into the men's room and go into one of the stalls and close the door. I mean, I'd just sit on, you know, sit down there. I wouldn't need to have to go to the bathroom or anything. Understand. I would have a place to sit that nobody would talk to me, nobody would see me. And I'd just run through and try to isolate in my head what was wrong, what was stopping me at a certain time. Nine out of ten times I'd have the answer when I'd come out. Yes, there was a pressure. It was a ten-minute break. I mean, one could have nightmares about uh, uh, not getting the orchestration done in time. Uh, I think there was a famous story about Quincy Jones, like up in his hotel room uh, years ago, with the arrangements not done. Um, with um, Paul Simon in the studio mm -hmm. with a lot of musicians, <laughs> the whole string section. And I've had, I've had um, many correlated dreams like this, not being finished in time, not having it done. When, when you come up with the solutions, do you just, do, do you play it on the piano for the musicians? Do you dictate it? Do That's a good, good question. Um, an average session for me would be get my rhythm players, whoever's on the date, bring their, and I don't write out like a bass part, like per se, I do write certain lines where I want the bass to maybe hold a note or play off of the fourth beat into the down. And I'll signify things like that, but I'll give a certain kind of um, liberty I wouldn't write a drum part out. I might say, yes, play a cross stick, go to the snare, snare drum here. Um, but what I would do is um, gather them around the keyboard and play the song for them hmm. and sing it. And whether I was the singer on the, I wasn't the singer on the date, but just let them know the song. Would, if there was another singer, would you have them listen to you singing it as well? Not or? necessarily, okay. because that singer would know the song before we were in the studio. How many takes typically does it take to get through a number before you're comfortable with it? Is there any average on that? I've overdone it. You know, I mean, Dion's first record that uh, Dion wore, uh, Don't Make Me Over, it was probably 28 or 29 wow. takes, you know, but it, it, we had it for. I keep going for. Let's get it. Can we top what we got? And the challenge always is, and it's a great kind of, it's not a game. It, uh, the challenge is to um, have everybody meet at the 100% mark. In other words, um, the singer will give that performance, that magical performance, the drummer will play better than he's played on any of it. Everybody will have connected in this. I love the recording process where everybody is in the studio at the same time because rather than making a track, I, I've never, never comfortable with that, making a track, yeah. having the singer come in, because I like having, just say the drummer or the keyboard player, react to what the singer has just been singing. If when you do all these takes, is it ever true that if you go, when you go back and listen, that the first take actually turns out to be, even if there are flaws, the most exciting or the yeah, the of course, okay. of course, of course. And there are some um, some days I've done uh, um, that were that were just caught caught magic in this two takes, three takes, never went beyond. Like the Ron Isley album that I did with him, where. I tried to reinvent a lot of these songs that had been done in a different way. And we took two, two rooms at Capitol Records, and Studio A and B, and joined them together and put the strings in one. Hey, 
we did Alfie on the first take, and that was it, you know? Really? Yeah. And because there was, it put him in a room, not baffle him off, put him where he's almost part of the orchestra. Uh, but that's him who? Uh, Ron Isley. Okay, okay. Put Ron Isley uh, out in the room. And that's an exceptional studio because he can do that. This studio, I think Sinatra used to record in. D did you have a mentor for s the studio work, for f how to work with musicians and produce and all of that, or is it something you just learned? I think by you learn that. I think you learn that. Uh, do you learn orchestration from, uh, I mean, I remember Henry Mancini had a, a book on orchestration that had reference discs. So you want to see how he scored six bars of Pink Panther. You could see his actual score. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could then see, it, you know, all written in concert key uh, and hear it. And that was a little, but, but I was beyond that because I used to, I used to look at some arrangements that, um, and it's also seeing what you can, hey, when I started, Mark, I, I didn't have a clue, really. I said, well, we got nine violins on the date, that's great. So each violin must be playing its own part. See, that's real, just dense on my part. Uh, no, you have nine violins and you don't want to have nine different parts. You yeah. do want to have them, um, hopefully more than nine, because nine is a little light for, um, but with a great engineer. And I did a lot with Phil Ramone, and Phil Ramone was a, was a violinist. And Phil oh, I didn't Ramone, know that. Yeah. A prodigy. And so he could get a string sound that was unbelievable when he was, uh, when he was recording, when he was an engineer. I, I wanted to go back a little bit more about the composition process. Yeah. Um, you, you, on the one hand, you talk about how it sort of comes greatly fully formed in your mind, but yeah. you've also talked about, I think Alfie, you said it took you three weeks to write. It is did. that you, is each, is it a new version each time, or yeah. do you, how do you refine and change until you, did, is it, is it note by note saying, I, this one is too obvious? And you don't want to go note by note. You want to go the whole vertical picture and see where it's going. And uh, that, you know, that was an important, very important lyric. Um, and that was basically setting um, Hal's lyric. Because uh, it had, had to conform to what this movie was about. So if the assignment had come in, the movie's coming out, would you guys, you guys write a song for Alfie, the title song? And if I had gone to the piano and just kind of fooled around and came up with a melody, or that wouldn't work. I mean, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, in many situations the words have to come first, mm -hmm. and they have to be set. Uh, I just did a show with Stephen Sater that opened at the Old Globe in uh, San Diego at the end of last year. Um, and uh, he's a wonderful lyricist, he, and he writes very musically. He writes, I mean, where things fall. It's never like the second verse. You have to ask for it. Well, you see, you got too many, <laughs> too many syllables. I'm like, no, he, he was right on, verse after verse, without knowing any melody. He just knew, and um, but there again, uh, it, it's a different way to write. It would take me to a different place, setting. With Alfie, I knew how important that song could be. I knew how powerful that movie was. I was not thrilled with their choice of uh, artist. Uh, didn't have control over that. And they uh, chose Cher uh, to sing it with Sonny 
producing her, Sonny Bono, at Gold Star Records. And, uh, Were you at the recording session at all? Or? I came in late. With, I was married to Angie Dickinson at the time, and we came in from the Dodger game. Um, and I wasn't sure what I was hearing when I walked in. It, it sounded like um, a Phil Spector record because Sonny kind of functioned that way, and that was the studio that Phil Spector always used. I mean, with the wall of sound, you know, yeah. three guitar players, a couple of percussion players. It had no resemblance to what Alfie was about. You, you, uh, and I, of course, covered it immediately with Dion. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned, I, I know, talking with Hal, that you've worked all, all different ways, sometimes the lyric first, sometimes the melody right. first, and sometimes more of a collaboration. Right, right. When you do get a melody first and you're setting it, I've seen some composers, you can see they'll have the, the lyric in front of them and they sort of mark out where they think the measure bars should be or the accents should be. So even before they look at a tune, they're sort of getting a rhythm. Is that part of your process at all? Yeah, but I don't mark it up. I, I, it's in my it's head. It's just in your head. It's in my head. Uh, you know, Promises, Promises was another situation where the lyrics really had to come basically first because they had to come off of a Neil Simon script. So they had to be as seamless as possible. So better to work with a lyric. See, that shocks me because yeah. I, my assumption would have been, I mean, that's one of the, your songs that has the most sort of meter changes in it. And I would have thought that would have been the case for um, when the music came first and that the, when it's the lyric first, it would be sort of a more traditional song. But it, it, it's fascinating to me that it wasn't that way. Well, Mark, if you look, if look at Alfie, you'll see that, I don't know, it's a, is it a 12-bar phrase or 11-bar phrase yeah. or something? It's not an 8-bar phrase. Uh, see, I, starting in the music business, I went through periods where I, um, uh, I wrote songs with Hal or Bob Hilliard or a couple of other writers and, um, and we gave them to record companies and A&R uh, arrangers and so-and-so would record a song. You know, I, I, I remember one instance of having a song that I thought, was maybe a really good song. It had a three-bar phrase, and I was told that if you make it a four-bar phrase, I'll give you Joe Stafford to record it, or I'll give you. And it was Joe Williams, you know, the great singer with the Basie Band. Uh, well, God, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they don't hear it as a three-bar phrase. But it, it was supposed to be a three-bar phrase. It wasn't supposed. And the minute it became a four-bar phrase, it got ruined, you know? And there's the example of, I got very excited Sinatra was doing, uh, I heard he was doing uh, Wives and Lovers uh, with the Basie Band. And Quincy was doing, Quincy Jones was doing. And um, then I heard the record, you know? It was in four. It's, a, it's, a, it's an out-and-out out waltz. Wives and Lovers. It is in 3-4. It's not in 4. Quincy, what happened? Why, why, why is it like in 4? And he said, um, Pacey Bay can't play in 3. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's so. Maybe it's not. The, the variation in the, the structure, the, the length of measures, and the, the, time for, yeah. uh, the timing of them, was part of that because of your training with Martinu and Cal and Mio? Because you sort of came from that classical background that you felt freer, you think, than other songwriters? Uh, it certainly helped. I mean, it certainly helped to be uh, aware of the extreme extent of some of the music that I was exposed to, whether it was John Cage or Lou Harrison, listening to their concerts. Uh, so you do feel influenced by other composers that way? Well, certainly there's a stockpile of musical knowledge that you get. You 
you assimilate. And uh, um, I mean, I never was much for the plain vanilla three chord song. You know, I, I was too sophisticated. I mean, I mean that in a different way, too sophisticated musically, maybe. So it's, you know, I got to, I tend to put the ninth in the chord. And, so, you know, that changes as I, I right now, there's something very basic about going. I mean, I just did an orchestration because on the tour in Australia, I wrote an orchestration on, I uh, hadn't done it in a long time for one of my singers. I just don't know what to do with myself. And, uh, which is a really good, good song that I'd kind of forgotten. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons I forgot about it, sort of, was because it really does start, I just don't know what to do with myself. So it's basically a C chord going to an F chord, going back to a C chord. And though I tried to play with, let me see if I can go for pure C and then go to an F, but let's put the second in there, uh, in the right hand. And it doesn't belong. Hmm. And then there are chords that get be very lush later. And then the second four bars. It's a minor seventh, a minor ninth, a B flat major seventh. And but it, those opening bars are structurally belong to C major, pure vanilla, F, pure, and. C. Just based on the title of the song, it seems like a perfect illustration of the title. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, it's a good song. And, um, uh, you know, I hadn't been doing it in, in concert and did it. Um, I did it one time with Elvis Costello, but that was a different arrangement. I wrote this arrangement for because I knew we were dealing with symphony orchestras down in Australia, so I knew I could get the violins up in the mm. atmosphere. You, you seem to have a penchant for, for high string lines, for people singing high in their tessituras. Is there something? Well, particularly, particularly singers. Uh, and th that's why, you know, I've gravitated to uh, more to uh, the um, female voice. Is there more emotion that comes out? I'm, I'm trying to think who gave me what I'd want. You know, Gene Pitney was great. I'm trying to think of a male artist that I had success with. Gene Pitney was great. Um, Tom Jones? Tom is great. But, you know, there are different voices than Luther Vandross. You know, and Isaac Hayes. See, I guess I was always gravitating towards the urban. I mean, that's why the thing, the, the album, though, it was kind of a cult album, the album with Ron Isley. Uh, so special because he gave me everything that I could possibly. And he did it where those were the vocals right there with a million musicians playing at the same time, bam. So many of the singers who perform with you, they may have wonderful ranges and amazing pitch and all of that, but they seem to be, there, there's a light, breathy quality to them. Um, the, you don't, t especially the female singers, you don't have, tend to work with belters and big voices. Is, is that similar to the, the high range, that that's, there's something in that sound that you have a preference for? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not big on working with the, the diva singers, naming no names, you know, that kind of go into uh, great vocal tricks and things like that. That's a different kind of vocal trick than you get from Aretha. Aretha will give you a lick that you say, oh man, you know, impeccable. So many of your songs have melisma, vocal melismas. Are, are those, do, do they evolve in the studio or that's in the song from the very beginning? Give me a, give um, me a 
um, oh, um, the Dion song, Walk On By, right. the way the by goes sort of at the end of phrases. Um, you know, it, it's not just a straight tone. The, you know, the one note travels. Yeah, um, well, it travels through and it holds from uh, with the two piano figure that comes in, Walk On By, and then you got that line that's going, which is a, the two pianos. Mm -hmm playing a, a little bit of a dissonant thing, and which is a, kind of a sense of an urgency. It's an interesting song when you really look at Walk On By. There is no bridge, there is no chorus, really. But all with, from the very beginning, the, that whole Walk On By and the, yeah. the, the sort of the extensions was always, it wasn't something that she sort of evolved with you in the studio. No. Okay. When you compose for film, um, not not the songs for films, but just instrumental music, and you're not limited by the the range of a human voice. Does that change how you write? Do you do you feel oh, yeah. freer in a different way? Do you approach it differently? I think it's music. You see, and for me, uh, Mark, it's been like uh, um, first film I scored was What's New Pussycat, and. Uh, it was a terrifying experience because I didn't have much time. Got the picture late. Had never seen a rough cut in my life. Uh, Angie was very, very helpful. Yeah, how was she helpful? Because she'd seen rough cuts. Okay. And she could change reels this before okay. we had DVDs, you know? And she could change Not reels. Not in terms of giving you musical ideas or something? No. Okay. No, but would help me through it. Um, uh, and, um, you know, for me to get involved with the motion picture, and that's why, I, one of the reasons why I've done not that many, I have to really kind of love it, be hooked on it, and also pay, um, pay a lot of attention to knowing it. Uh, I've seen the movie 220 times by the time I get on a scoring stage. So I don't need the streamers. I listen to the dialogue. I know where the music is supposed to be out. I've memorized the whole thing. I won't conduct with a click track. I never did a, I never did a Butch Cassidy with a click track. I mean, I just knew every line. I knew, uh, you know, with Butch Cassidy, which, was just this amazing experience because it was an amazing movie. And that'll spoil you for a movie that might come your way afterwards that you look at and you say, can I see this 200 times? Do you agree just based on reading the scripts? No. No, I mean, uh, I knew the writer. I knew Goldman was a great writer. Paul Newman, Redford. Uh, George Ray Hill was the director. George Ray Hill, um, when I went in to have a meeting with him at, at 20th Century Fox, uh, when you walk in to a director's office and he's at the piano playing Bach, really, you say, ooh, ooh, well, this is really good and this is really bad. This is somebody who knows music. And... Um, and also, it could be, uh, it could be tough on your music. So, um, he w was great, you know, he, he knew exactly what he wanted. Some directors would get very nervous with a film because they, they're concerned and they want the music to save the film and more music is better than less music. And, Oh, what that does is uh, make it more difficult, you know? I mean, nothing's going to save the film if it isn't there. And George Ray Hill just said, I've got these major sections in this movie, and that's where I want music, and I want the music to be important. And that's all I want. That's where I want the music. And I have to say, that's courage on his part, because I know that when I was working on the bicycle scene and watching the, that, I guess the point I was trying to say before, and I got 
sidetrack. I didn't get the theme on What's New Pussycat until I kept watching Peter Sellers' character over and over. And I saw the craziness and the off-center and the behavior and the wildness and Dr. Fassbender and, you know, and, you know, and then this theme worked. But if I had taken music notes and gone on my remembrance and recall of what that film felt like uh, as it is the standard usually with music composers, or used to be anyway, they take notes, film out, music out at this scene, music in, what happens, dialogue there. No, I never would have gotten that had I not lived with Peter Sellers and his character. And same with Ursula Andress and, and Casino Royale. I kept watching her over and over, which was something extraordinary to watch. Yeah. And so Look of Love was born that way. But it was a very sensual theme. I scored it for a small rhythm section, a very sexy sax player, with a very loose kind of bossa feel. Uh, and Hal added lyrics that began with Look of Love. And uh, back to George Roy Hill and, um, you know, Butch Cassidy. That was a big risk, you know. For me, I saw that bicycle scene, and I had a melodic fragment that was working. And very often, what I do want is when I'm writing, I'll put dummy lyrics down. I think Paul Simon does the same thing, and he dumps them later. But when he's writing, he's putting words that sound good on such such a note. I've done things where I write on trumpet parts, like on a record date. Um, uh, words. Um, it's different than when playing an eighth note and a quarter note and another eighth note. Do you share it with musicians? Yeah, they don't have to read it. And they look, you know, so it's actually on their parts. So absolutely. Huh. You can get a guy that comes in, he's got an attitude, you know, and say, what, what is this supposed to mean, you know? And, well, what, what? Hey, man, sing the part. You know, you play it like you're singing it. Stay with me is different than da, da, da. You'll play it differently. There are no accents, there are no marks, there are no lines. There, there's nothing that can, can replace an actual sing the part on your trumpet. I know the lyric means nothing. It's not part of the lyric. It's just part of your part. So um, I kept hearing, uh, hearing the title, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Which was different than what he'd asked for originally. In no, he, he, hadn't, he said, write something. Here's the bicycle sequence. But I thought you said grand themes is what he wanted. And that yeah, was, yeah, here was a grand theme. Okay. It didn't say there's going to be a song there, but I had the title. It was a perfect place to have. What a, a line that we crossed, actually, and how filled out the rest of the, and made a story out of What, raindrops keep falling on my head? That works. I mean, they're in Bolivia and they're screwed, you know. They're, <laughs> They're, they're going to get it. I mean, they're going to lose in the end. But at the moment, uh, you know, it's kind of a carefree thing. And um, he took that chance. Here's something that took place in Bolivia, and it's turn of the century, and it's a sort of like a cowboy picture. And, and we're writing something that works for... It certainly works for the time and place that this movie was taking place. And yet you could play on Top 40 radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that we got, he liked it. He said, let's go with it. Who will we get? I don't know. Ray Stevens, let's get Ray Stevens out. Because Ray Stevens was very, would have been very appropriate. 
we flew, flew him out, 20th century flew him out, uh, got him, um, he saw the movie and heard the song. He hated the movie and hated the song and got on a plane and left. <laughs> Much to his regret. <coughs> Who knows, I guess. When you did Promises, Promises, as, as far as I know, it was your first musical. Was that a different process? Did it surprise you? Did you have to use different muscles than you've used before? Lyrics all first, practically. How, why was it that you asked Sondheim who, who to get as an orchestrator for it? Where well, that's always been the legend. Uh, I'm not sure how I found Jonathan Tunick. Had Jonathan done... Or was it the other way around? That you're, I were, you were the first Broadway musical he did, and the story goes that you'd ask Sondheim to suggest somebody. I didn't know Stephen. Huh. So I may have asked him. Um, it may have been the conductor who was going to conduct the show who recommended Jonathan. And uh, then Jonathan went on and did all of Sondheim's stuff. He's a wonderful orchestrator and wonderful to work with. When you work with other orchestrators, how do you, how much information do you give them about what you want, what you're hearing, or do you let see what they come up with first? Or mm -hmm. Jonathan is very cute. He said because we just worked together on Some Lovers, I came out, and I'd sit for hours I'm at the keyboard looking at the music. And I'm basically telling him what I want. Then he has his freedom to go. He says, I'm the only, only composer that <laughs> he's ever done that with. Whether others don't orchestrate, or I don't think Stephen does. Um, but I'm too much of a control freak. Boy, I hear a line, and I, I'm good at just taking a pencil and saying, out, this is out, this is... No. Do you hear arrangements that other people do of your songs and you're particularly pleasantly surprised that you say, oh, even though it's different from what you had done, you, you think it, the liberties they took are interesting or good? When, in last night's concert, when one of your numbers was done with a reggae beat that was... How do you respond to things like that? I love Stevie. I love Stevie. Is it my favorite song to do as a reggae? Make it easy on yourself? No, of course not. Make it easy on yourself. It's just a very powerful, emotional song. One of our earliest songs. Um, on record, it's a different thing. In concert, when you change it, and uh, I mean, I've, I've got a record that was sent to me by a Philadelphia disc jockey by a group called The Dells that recorded on Chess Records, where they recorded, it was called The Hits of Dionne Warwick. And I, my name wasn't even mentioned, but they were all our songs, house, my songs. And they're great arrangements. And they were soulful, and they changed chords, and they changed, but it all kind of is okay when it's really in good taste, you know? And and the song in itself has been established. See, you have a new song. Somebody goes and records it and changes it. So on the first time that song is used, it's, uh, it's been altered. Like Brooke Benton did the first record of House Is Not A Home. And I said, that's wrong. Man, he's getting, this guy's getting paid to sing it for the, by the film company. It's too good a song. I mean, he, he, you know, I, I'd say, Rocky, the chair is still a, not a chair, is still a chair. And then, even when there's no one sitting there, goes up in thirds, yeah. You know, his attitude was off. Hey man, listen, uh, you know, I'd read music, but I don't want to spoil my soul. Well, you know, give me a break. It's back to the same thing. You're on an airplane, be able to write, learn solfege, learn how to notate, how to read a piece of music. Do, do you see an evolution in your 
compositional process? Or the, uh, some composers seem to get simpler as they get older, that they don't need as much, they become sort of less is more, and others become more wildly experimental and are sort of pushing the envelope. Do you, do you see anything like that in your own work? or? You know, I think it varies, it goes. I mean, I think the album I did with Elvis Costello, Painted from Memory, uh, with those songs that we wrote together, they're very special and they're very different. And uh, I could look at the score for Some Lovers that I've done with Stephen Sater, which we're talking about now. The next step would be a regional theater, possibly here in Washington. Um, this is a long way to get to Broadway, or off Broadway yeah. even. Um, but is it a different way of writing music? Um, hey, I don't like to make things complicated for people. Okay. I remember with Promises, Promises, Jerry Orbach, after three months, you know, and came and see the show in New York. And Jerry Orbach had to leave, and he's kind of angry. He said, every night, God damn, I got to sing this song. Promises, Promises, I'm through with Promises. I hardly catch my breath, you know. And I think, yeah, he's right. I don't like to make it difficult and hard for people. I don't want to exhaust you with a song. And be careful of that. I am very careful about that with dynamics and orchestration, too, you know. I don't want, you know, I am my own judge. Uh, not that audience out there. That may get to judge the work. It's got to pass by me. It's got to live by me. And if I'm questioning it by the third or fourth day, it's like, you know, you can hear songs that are great for three, four days a week. Ear candy. You don't want to hear them anymore. Um, Promises, Promises belonged to have this kind of energy. The guy is angry. He is through. I mean, he's been shafted in that office. And because people have been promising him things, and he just said, promises, promises, and I'm all through with promises, promises now, you know? And it was hard to do it night after night with a change in tempo, too, because, you know, unless you're working with a click track or a preliminary click track to at least start at the tempo you think that is the right tempo, it may shift, which I like. I'm very much in favor of that with some lovers that we just did. I like the idea that the conductor worked with the click track because we knew what the tempo, after fooling with it, was the best tempo and at least have it as a preliminary click. You know, he's hearing it in his headset. Okay, the click is turned off when the music starts, but at least we started in the tempo. Promises, Promises, Dion recorded it, and I made the record with her. She floats through it with the greatest ease, kind of fluid, fluent. I don't want to make it difficult on, on, on I, I didn't mean to suggest that. No, but, but I, I, you know, I don't want to make it difficult on an audience. I don't. So uh, as far as changing my songs, um, it, it, you know, I didn't want to, I, I was not crazy about the record I made on Say a Little Prayer with Dion. And uh, though because of the I tempo. It, it was the tempo, yeah. yeah. Tempo, and there was, and Aretha's record is far better, sorry. <laughs> you know, there's no doubt about it. I love Aretha's record. It, it seems like one of the extraordinary things about your work is in every way, how it constantly shifts. The colors shift, the thickness of the texture shift, um, the, um, the, the instrumentation, the, um, the dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 my sense is it, it sort of gives aliveness to the things and, and keeps 
a certain amount of surprise going? Is, is there a conscious thing about that? Is it something? Are you thinking about the audience's point of view then? No, or no, no, you don't think about the audience. You don't think about the audience. You're thinking about what's working for you. So you're the audience. Yeah, it's kind of pass. My room. It's got to got to have my blessing and I got to be okay with it. I got to go through the nights where I can't sleep because I keep hearing a damn song in my head. It's good and bad. One is that you don't get much sleep and the other is that it's like a jukebox in your head. And it's good when you're working like that. And um, what was your question? The the, the, the all the surprises, change. the colors, okay. the writing, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. dynamics, and yes. tempo. And so it's like if you had a young singer and you brought a young singer to me and say, "Well, she could be really great. Could you do? Could you write a song like uh, Don't Make Me Over? Could you do that?" Um, and uh, like you did for Dion kind of redo something like that. And I couldn't do that. I wouldn't know how to do that. I mean, you move on. The minute you stay stationary, you get stagnant. And that's why, for me, I haven't done it here since I've been here in Washington. Uh, even at home, if I'm not writing anything, let's just let me get to the piano. Just do you sometimes play just for pleasure? Just get, keep in touch with my music. Keep I, in touch. I think our time is... Thank you for, for your time today. Ah, you're thank welcome. you for all the joys your work's given millions of us. And I'm most appreciative of that. Yeah. I'm most appreciative of that. Well, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, by writing this music and being able to have this music, the joy that it gives me to then go out and perform it and being able to do that and being able to conduct a symphony orchestra and do my music and maybe make people feel good, feel something, feel something in their heart or take their mind off something that's been bothering them. That's a big plus. Didn't know that was going to happen. In fact, before somebody suggested I go on stage, you know. Nice being here with you, Mark. It's our pleasure, my pleasure. It's a very enjoyable experience. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.